when humanity first encountered alien life, we were disappointed. Not in them. They were everything we could have hoped. They showed us technological marvels that outdid all but the most imaginative science fiction. Back then, we could barely wrap our feeble minds around their tech. Scientists claim to understand it now, but I'm not convinced. We were disappointed in ourselves. Before first contact, we had spent centuries dreaming of our role among spacefaring races. Would we be the warriors? The diplomats? The engineers? We got our answer, when we sent the Lewis and Clark across the galaxy. As it turns out, maintaining a course in hyperspace over a long distance, is more difficult than we predicted. We had been aiming for a stretch of empty space near Alpha Centauri. We jumped out of hyperspace next to a planet we hadn't even known existed, directly in the path of an alien space freighter. The freighter escaped with a dent in its bow. Half of Lewis and Clark was crushed, and fewer than half the crew members survived. So, first contact didn't go exactly as we had hoped. It mostly consisted of the Grusgruff trying desperately to treat the injured humans with no information on our biology. Surprisingly, most of them survived. They modeled our treatment on the Kikai, another species of mammalian bipedal predators. Close enough. Speaking of the Grusgruff, we're damn lucky we bumped into them. Anyone else would have winkled us out of our natural resources, or sold us alien tech at ten times what it was worth, or in the case of the Kikai enslaved us. They took us under their wing and protected us from those who would exploit us. They don't have human family units, but I like to think they look on us as a little sibling. Young, not that bright, exasperating, but ultimately loved. We love them too, even if they are ugly as sin. As translation progressed, things got weird. And embarrassing. Professor Sterla asked one of the ship's engineers if the Lewis and Clark was our first FTL-capable ship. Well, he actually asked, how did you get off the ground in that rickety insult to space travel, but the translator had more tact. Depends, she said after pausing to think. Does it count as working, if the ship gets where it's going, but then explodes? In the following weeks, we learned our place among sentient species. Not the warriors, not the diplomats, and certainly not the engineers. No. We were the slow-witted children of the galactic community. Our machines were death traps. Our architecture was nightmare. The less said of our medical science, the better. And worst of all, it had taken us eons to even advance this far. The longest it had taken any other race to discover FTL after achieving sentience was 50,000 years. Us. 200,000. Compared to any other species, we have no head for math or science. We're the galactic equivalent of an English major in a physics class. The Grusgruff adopted us out of pity, I think. They knew we would never make it on our own. We would resent it if it weren't true. Unlike the other races though, they learned to appreciate our talents. We may have been out of place, but we weren't stupid. By comparison, alien art was downright primitive. We did things with perspective and shading that astounded the Grusgruff. They exclaimed in awe and delight that our paintings looked as if they might leap off the page. Within a decade of first contact, all but the most die-hard traditionalist artists had adopted human techniques. And digital art. Who would ever have thought to draw with a computer? Legend says the first Grusgruff to hear human music thought he had lost his mind. Human music calls up images and feelings across the species barrier. No alien had imagined half the instruments we use in a single trashy pop song. Before us, musicians and audiophiles were considered a strange subculture. Now every Grusgruff has a favorite song. No one tells a story like humans. Alien novels are short, dry, and straightforward. The longest work of fiction ever written by an alien clocks in at just under one million words when translated, and it took a lifetime to compose. Compare that to our four million words, done in seven years. 
The Xenos used to read fiction when they had nothing better to do. We taught them to read for the joy of it. I think it shocked the Grosgrith just how much we, a slow-changing people, changed them in the century we've known one another. But I don't think they mind. Of course, the other races look down on them now, because they look down on us, when they spare us a thought that is. They never got over the perception that we were a species of idiots. I have to admit, even being handed the latest Grosgrith technology, we struggle to catch up. Ironically, the Kikai hate us the most. Not only do we have the nerve to look like them, but we're weak and stupid, too. I retract my earlier statement. They wouldn't have enslaved us. They would have exterminated us. We're an embarrassment to mammalian bipedal predators. Still, the war declaration came as a shock. We figured they would need a reason at least, and we hadn't done anything. We tried telling them that. Big mistake. I watched it live on television. You lie, screamed the Kikai ambassador, trembling with rage. Or do you call this nothing? He shoved a paper in the hapless diplomat's face. On it was a painting. A dozen people, one from each of the Kikai's slave races, tugged at either side of a huge chain. The middle link was beginning to crack. The caption read, work together. Break your chains. Frankly, it wasn't that great. The caption was unimaginative, the shading was all over the place, and the artist had a tenuous grasp of Amdansi anatomy. Useless propaganda. The Kikai thought otherwise, and with good reason. This piece of useless propaganda had inspired no fewer than three slave revolts. Rumors said more were brewing. No matter how many people they beheaded, they couldn't get it to stop circulating. Until that day, no one in the galaxy had seen us as a threat. Militarily, we weren't. Even if we'd been tech wizards like the other species, our numbers were small. I'm ashamed to say it, but we actually tried to surrender immediately. That wasn't what the Kikai wanted. They wanted to see us bleed. Resigned to our fate, we marched to war. I don't like thinking about those days right after the war declaration. No one chattered on the streets anymore. Every face was blank with shock. People burst into tears in public and nobody even glanced at them. We were as good as extinct and we knew it. All we could do was make the bastards work for it first. The Grusgruff blessed them, marched with us. They could easily have booted us off their planets and saved their own hides. Instead, they condemned millions to die for the sake of their dim-witted friends. I like to think we'd have done the same, but I don't really believe it. They're better people than we'll ever be. It's no wonder they have so many allies. They called all of them to war. Most of them never responded. Some sent overly polite, overly verbose letters that boiled down to, fuck no. The Zurag outright laughed in their faces. In the end, two species lent token support, a handful of brigades, so they could say they had honored the alliance. I joined the military. I figured if I was going to die, I might as well do it fighting. My first battle was on Skoshernst, a newly settled Grosgriff colony at the edge of their territory. I'll never forget the Kikai ships blotting out the stars as they rolled toward us. The Grosgriff next to me turned and said, in guttural English, we are damned. I couldn't say anything back. He was right. That Grosgriff, whose name I never found out, died with his brain splattered on my uniform. Skoshernst burned. The war went no better. Oh, sure, there were victories. But there were thrice as many losses, and whole planets were glassed with no true battles at all. We simply lacked the numbers to fight them wherever they landed. Steadily, the Kikai swarmed toward Earth and Grusgrith Prime. Morale was at an all-time low. We were fighting a war we knew, had known from the start, we couldn't win. And our soldiers were exhausted. We had no rest. Being so gravely outnumbered, we had to be everywhere at once. We were always either fighting, or on the move, sometimes both. Soldiers began turning their guns on themselves. 
Sim just stopped eating. But we couldn't give up, the Kikai wouldn't let us. In an attempt to raise spirits, the New York Times published an account, only slightly embellished, of the Battle of Moloton. A single platoon had hijacked a Kikai ship, spending all its ammo before ramming the ship into another and going out in a blaze of glory. The rest of the army turned the tide, inspired by their comrade's sacrifice. An uplifting story, but we were too far gone to care. The Fsi, one of the species who supported us, were not. Having sent fewer than 10,000 soldiers to her aid, their army was essentially untouched. They swooped in to save us at the Battle of the Great Bay. The Kikai were crushed. As soon as the battle was over, our leaders turned to theirs and asked, what gives? One of their generals had stumbled across the story about the Battle of Moloton. She had been so moved that she petitioned the president to send more troops. He dreaded and sent the entire goddamn army. We were still badly outnumbered and outgunned, but by God, it was something. A little hope seeped back into the world. The media exploded with praise and thanks for the FSI. One image in particular stands out in my mind. A child's drawing of a FSI, holding hands with a girl's father, who was off fighting in some hellhole, light years away from his family. The FSI, never a warlike species, saw it all, and joined the military in record numbers. Last I heard, it had swelled to half again its former largest size. And the war was still hopeless. The FSI saw it as clearly as we did. So they called in their friends from every corner of the galaxy, no matter how tenuous the alliance. With their messages they attached a tale of Moloton, art of humans at war, obituaries of brave soldiers, anything they hoped might touch others the way it had touched them. Overnight, half a dozen species joined our cause. The Kikai Collective was huge, absurdly populous. It would be an uphill battle. But for the first time, we had a chance we had a real chance. When I realized that, it was as if I had won the whole war myself. Human art flooded alien networks. Support began to trickle, then pour in. The Grusgris allies rallied around the friends they had spurned. Even the Zerag sent a few divisions our way. The Kikai banned all human media, but to no avail. Someone always finds a way to smuggle it in. Slave revolts are erupting all across their empire. Their own soldiers, swayed by our voices, have begun to turn on their leaders. We are the tech illiterate morons of the galaxy. We're fighting against a race that has been fine-tuning their war machines for hundreds of thousands of years. And we're winning. Author's name and the link to original text is in the description.